was nationally and internationally, worldwide audience, wanting to know why this 10-year-old was killed. I still feel the pain when I look at other young people growing up successfully. It always reminds me that, oh, that may could have been a doctor. I looked at this little boy and thought, that could be my brother, that could be one of my cousins, that could be someone from my family. Damilola Taylor could have been anybody's son, brother, or relative. He was just a 10-year-old Nigerian boy, but he could have been an English boy. He could have been a Jamaican or an Asian. He had just moved to a new country with his family, full of hopes and dreams for a better future. But those dreams died with Dami on November 27, 2000, when he was fatally wounded by a gang member and left to die in the arms of a stranger. His final words were a reassurance, I'm okay. In this video, we will explore the details of Demilola's life and death, the challenges and controversies of the investigation and trials, and the lessons that have been learned 20 years on. Demilola Taylor was born in Lagos, Nigeria on December 7, 1989 to Richard and Gloria Taylor, both from the Yoruba ethnic group. He had an elder brother Tunde and an elder sister, Bemi, who suffered from severe epilepsy and needed medical treatment in the UK. Dami was a smart and curious kid who made it easy for everyone around him to fall in love with him. As a young person, you know, Dami Lola was lovable by everybody. He attended Wisdom Montessori School in Ikozi Ketu, Lagos, where he excelled in his studies and made many friends. He had a passion for football and wanted to become a doctor when he grew up. From his earliest days, Dami Lola displayed a remarkable curiosity and an insatiable hunger for knowledge. He carried this positive energy with him that made it impossible for anyone not to notice in a room. Anywhere he is, he wants to be noticed, you know. He wants, because he's doing, you know, good things, he was doing the positive things, you know, he's taking part in activities. Even as a toddler, Dami related well with elderly people that his father thinks he must have been an adult in a child's body. He always relates with the elderly people, you know, those who are older than him. Uh, I think he's a very old boy, you know, I'm, t I'm, very, I'm sure, you know, that that boy is not uh, <laughs> it's not ordinary. In August 2000, Dami Lola and his family moved to Peckham, South London, to seek medical help for his epileptic elder sister, Bemi, while their father continued his job as a civil servant in Lagos, Nigeria. Everything was fine. School was good for the young people, but medical reasons had to um, make us uh, decide on uh, the movement back to the UK. Initially, Richard wanted Demilola to stay back with him in Lagos because he was just 10 and schooling at the time. So he felt that letting him move to the UK would have some negative impact on his education as he might find it difficult to adapt to the new environment. But Dami pleaded with his father to let him go with his mother and siblings. His eyes, like two beacons of hope, shimmered with dreams that stretched far beyond the boundaries of his homeland. So Richard let him go with them, but on the condition that he would return to Nigeria after three months. I was saying, okay, let him come back after three months, you know. So he said, no, he's going to stay back and uh, have his education here. When they arrived in the UK, the family lived in a flat on the North Peckham Estate, a notorious area plagued by poverty, crime, and violence. Damilola enrolled at Oliver Goldsmith Primary School, where he quickly adapted to his new environment and impressed his teachers with his enthusiasm and intelligence. Every um, time I called him, he was very happy that he was enjoying it. He told me he has become a prefect. He also joined a local library and a computer club where he enjoyed exploring the world of technology and information. He was a friendly and cheerful boy who liked to help others and make them laugh. He had a positive outlook on life and a strong faith in God. However, life in Peckham was not easy for the Taylors. They faced discrimination and hostility from some of their neighbors, who resented their presence and mocked their accents. They also had to cope with the dangers of living in a crime-ridden estate where gangs of youths roamed the streets and terrorized the residents. While in school, Damilola didn't have many friends. He was studious and he isolated himself from every form of distractions, but this made him a target for bullying. You know, if you're Nigerian and you're really focused on your education, other children aren't that interested, then that makes you a target. One of those bullying sessions would then lead to his tragic death. After a normal school day on November 27, 2000, Damilola spent the rest of his day at an after-school computer club at a local library. He started using the library because instead of going home, daylight, you know, um, going to the library to become dark, to go home. 
and that's where the problem started, you know. And he finished at the library at about 4.51 p.m. and was captured on CCTV walking home, but he never got home. Dami was only 400 yards from his home when he encountered a group of teenage boys aged between 12 and 16 near the North Peckham estate. These boys were believed to be members of a local gang called the Young Peckham Boys. They surrounded him and demanded that he take off his new silver jacket and hand it over to them. When he refused, they attacked him with a broken beer bottle to his left thigh and damaged his artery. Of course, when you get injured to the degree that he was, he was stabbed by a bottle. Um, the impact was of such that he was bleeding to death, but he didn't result in immediate death, so that there was a small time period for him to then try and gain attention from somebody. They left him alone there to bleed out, but being the strong, spirited boy that he was, Dami Lola staggered as he made his way towards home, hoping to find some help. He managed to reach a concrete stairwell in one of the blocks of apartments on the North Peckham estate, where he collapsed. And then he collapsed at the top of this stairwell. And it was at that point that a member of the public, who happened to be a carpenter from nearby, came to the rescue and actually followed the trail of blood. The cop followed the trail of red body fluid from the stairwell up to where Demi Lola lay at the top of the stairwell, almost unconscious. He immediately picked up his phone and dialed 999. Uh, can you see, can you see the ambulance? To a place road. Blake's road? Or yeah, road? yeah, road, road. Well, yeah, well, yeah, Lola continued to bleed out the little life left in him. Yeah, it's a boy bleeding to death. He's right. it, actually bleeding to death. Uh, this boy is approximately about 12 years of age. Yeah, what he, has lost, he has lost a hell of a lot of blood. Yeah. How have he done that? What happened? We do not know, sir. We've just come out and found him on the staircase. He's tried to climb up. He's falling. Right, where is he bleeding from? He's, he's going. He's, he's in a Where is he bleeding from? We cannot tell. He then collapsed into the hands of this stranger who had become his family in those final moments and muttered what would be his final words, reassuring him, I'm okay. Damilola was still alive when paramedics arrived and they immediately rushed him to the hospital. The doctors and nurses tried all they could to resuscitate the young man, but he was pronounced dead at 5.47 p.m. This was just 10 days away from his 11th birthday. Meanwhile, Dami Lola's mother, Gloria, was already on the streets searching for him because it was unusual for him to have stayed out that late. She was more worried because Dami Lola had told her a few days ago about his experience with the bullies. Gloria's suspicion was confirmed when she eventually stumbled upon a cop cordon on Blake's Road. The officer told her that a young boy had been attacked and killed there. Gloria instantly knew at that moment that that was his son, Damilola. Richard was at work in Nigeria when he received what would be the most uh, devastating uh, call I ever took in my life. As the news of his baby's tragic death was broken to him. The person at the other end just broke the news straight away that, look, Damilola went to school last night, yesterday, and he didn't come back home. Richard blacked out, and when he came to, he was in a hospital bed. After leaving the hospital, Richard made his way to the UK as fast as he could to be with his family. So I got here and the, the scene was uh, so disturbing, you know, what I came to meet here was uh, a lot of uh, media coverage, a lot of uh, sympathy, sympathizers. The bereaved father could not cope with the entire situation, so he demanded that he be left alone to get a grasp of what had happened. The news of Demi Lola's death shocked and saddened the nation. People were just uh, really just shocked, really, um, and then just appalled, and uh, it just created a huge wave of emotion in the local community. Dami Lola's parents were devastated by the loss of their beloved son, who had so much potential and dreams. His mother, Gloria, sadly later died of a heart attack in 2008, unable to cope with the grief. The public demanded justice for Dami Lola and called for action to tackle the problem of youth violence in Britain. The Metropolitan Police launched a massive investigation into the case, which involved hundreds of officers. However, finding Dami Lola's killers proved to be very difficult. The officers faced a wall of silence from the local community in Peckham, who were afraid or unwilling to cooperate with the authorities. Well, I think that people felt that it would be very difficult to get the people brought to trial because the people uh, who knew information might be fearful of giving that information, fearful of retribution, fearful that they themselves might 
come under attack. The authorities also lacked experience in dealing with children and gangs and failed to secure crucial evidence from the crime scene. In the first few weeks, the officers arrested and released 11 suspects because there was not enough evidence to pursue the investigation and charge them in court. In the following week, while the death of their son had barely started to sink in, a big memorial service was held on what was supposed to have been his 11th birthday. The memorial service was organized by the church where Gloria was attending with the children at the time. I, I still think I was in a state of um, shock. I, I don't even, even know that the service was going on. You know, I couldn't say a word. The highlight of this service was the moment Damilola's brother, Tunde, spoke on behalf of the family. My life can never be the same without you again. I have always wanted the brother to be there with me, that I could ask a question, and he could ask questions from me too, share each other's things, and above all, someone I can proudly call my brother. This was a moment of raw emotions as Dami Lola's family and friends paid tribute to the 10-year-old boy whose life was cruelly taken in a senseless act of violence. Eight months after Dami Lola's death, a 14-year-old girl came forward to give an eyewitness account of the moments leading to Dami Lola's death. She claimed she saw four boys chasing Dami Lola before he was attacked. This 14-year-old girl gave them some real key evidence and gave them some direct evidence. And by direct evidence, I mean she actually saw offenders. This testimony Testimony led to the arrest of four youths who were between the ages of 12 and 14 at the time of the killing. They went on trial on January 30th, 2002 for the murder of Demi Lola Taylor. However, the trial collapsed after the judge ruled that the girl's testimony was fundamentally flawed. And it was flawed on the basis that there was inducement as could be seen as her giving evidence. And that, that inducement, first of all, were related to a £50,000 possible reward that was on offer for her. She was also reportedly gifted clothes and a mobile phone by the investigators and officers. She changed her story several times and admitted lying to the investigators on record. With all these irregularities, the jury did see reasons the defense said she was an unreliable witness and why the suspects should be acquitted. So they went back to the investigators to seek justice. We couldn't accept uh, that verdict, you know, because we knew right from the beginning that uh, the police had the evidence to, to to prosecute and get a sentence uh, for, for, for the killers. The authorities were criticized for their handling of the case and accused incompetence and racism. Despite this setback, the police vowed to keep the investigation open and find new evidence to convict Damilola's killers. In 2005, they received a breakthrough when they made some new discoveries in the case that led to the arrest of some suspects who were part of the first 11 suspects initially arrested in connection with the case. All I can say at the moment is that three people this morning were arrested in connection with Damilola Taylor's murder. They're being held in a police station in South Africa. London. The suspects were two brothers, Danny and Ricky Preddy, who were 12 and 13 years old respectively at the time of Dami Lola's death. The third suspect was identified as Hassan Jihad, who was 15 years old during the time of the murder. Forensic evidence found traces of Dami Lola's DNA and clothes fiber on clothing belonging to the suspects, and this meant one thing. They were at the scene during the time the crime was committed. The suspects were charged with murder, and in 2006, they went on trial at the Old Bailey. The prosecution argued that they were part of the gang that attacked Demi Lola and inflicted the fatal wound with a broken bottle. But the defense, on the other hand, claimed that what happened was an accident. They said that the suspects got into a fight with Demi Lola, who then fell on the broken bottle that caused his death. On April 3rd, 2006, one of the suspects, Hassan Jihad, was cleared of all charges. And the next day, the jury reached a not guilty verdict on the murder charges against the Preddy brothers. However, they were unable to reach a verdict on manslaughter. The jury deliberated for 10 days and found the Preddy brothers brothers guilty of manslaughter by a majority verdict of 10 to 2. The Preddy brothers were sentenced to eight years in a young offender's institution. They were, however, released on parole in 2010 and 2011, respectively, after serving half of their sentences. They have since been involved in other crimes and have been sent back to prison several times for breaching their license conditions. The conviction of the Preddy brothers brought some closure to Demi Lola's family and the public. It enabled us to, to have a rest of mind about who, 
who, who did it. But it also raised questions about the root causes of youth violence and how to prevent it. Many experts and activists have argued that Dami Lola's death was a symptom of a deeper social problem, that of poverty, deprivation, lack of opportunities, and support for young people in disadvantaged areas. They have called for more investment in education, employment, health, and community services to help young people achieve their potential and stay away from crime. In Damilola's memory, his parents set up the Damilola Taylor Trust Fund, a charity that aims to provide opportunities and support for young people from disadvantaged backgrounds. I mean, some people you see, they campaign for the death penalty, they campaign for uh, more draconian laws, but Richard Taylor argued that young people who get involved in crime are themselves victims of terrible upbringing. The Trust runs various programs and initiatives such as scholarships, mentoring, sports and arts activities to help young people develop their skills and confidence. The Trust also campaigns for social justice and peace in communities affected by violence. Dami Lola's story is one of tragedy, hope, courage, and resilience, but also a stark reminder that even in the face of adversity, the human spirit can shine brightly, illuminating the path toward a more compassionate and inclusive world. His legacy lives on through his family and the Dami Lola Taylor Trust, a beacon of support and inspiration for generations to come. We would love to hear your thoughts about this case. Do you think justice will serve for Dami Lola and his family? Do you think the eight year sentence for Dami Lola's killers was fair for the crime they committed? Please share your thoughts with us in the comment section below. And if you have enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. Thank you for watching.